are very happy to have Dr. Brittany Cooper, who is an Associate Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Africana Studies at Rutgers University. Dr. Cooper is the author of Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thought of Race Women from University of Illinois Press in 2017. She's a winner of the Organization of American Historians Merrill Curdy Prize for Best Book in U.S. Intellectual History. She is also the author of the New York Times bestselling Eloquent Rage, A Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower uh, from St. Martin's Press, which you'll be hearing about shortly. Uh, Professor Cooper has been named to the root a hundred multiple times, most recently in 2020. She is a frequent commentator for MSNBC and her work has been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, BET, Essence Magazine, The Root, and many other publications. And I will also take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, our Director of Marketing for English, Joy Fisher-Williams, who will be talking about the format of our session and conducting an interview with Dr. Cooper. So uh, one, one quick thing that I, I wanna mention before um, Brittany and I get started is, uh, as you heard at kind of the tail end of our last conversation, uh, we have a really wonderful relationship uh, between Macmillan Learning and Macmillan Trade. So uh, what you have the option to do, as Kristen winds up, was pointing out, was uh, is to consider a, a trade book uh, for use in your composition course or as your common read. And then uh, that provides an opportunity for uh, you to talk with your Macmillan rep about bringing a speaker like Brittany Cooper to campus uh, and also about generating revenue for your department. So I just want to remind you of that. If you weren't in our last session, uh, that's certainly something we like to help facilitate uh, with uh, writing programs. Uh, so something else that I wanted to add to the really kind introduction that, that Vivian gave uh, for Brittany, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, who's another one of our authors, actually says that Brittany Cooper may be the boldest young feminist writing today, and she will make you laugh out loud. So I thought that was a, a ringing endorsement for a book that really takes on some challenging issues and helps us all think a bit more about um, Black feminism. So uh, welcome, Brittany. We're very glad that you're here and spending some time with us in what we're kind of calling our uh, happy slash discussion hour uh, with an author. So it's kind of a nice way to close up our conference. We've been talking a lot the last few days about uh, writing programs and how we can uh, better facilitate online writing instruction. Uh, what are the considerations if someone's teaching in a hybrid program? And what are some of the best practices to just uh, sort of make life easier uh, for those teaching and also for, for students? Um, so as we kind of shift gears, I want to uh, think of our discussion today in a couple of parts. Uh, first, for uh, every, everyone who attends the workshop is going to be receiving a copy of Eloquent Rage. Um, I realize some of you may have met it, uh, read it already, in which case, please share a copy with a friend. And uh, if you haven't, what we're going to do in the course of this conversation is set up uh, a little discussion about the book so you can better understand it from Brittany's perspective. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about what's happening right now in this political moment, uh, because the content of the book could not possibly be more relevant than it is right now. So we, we'd be remiss not to discuss that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the implications of using a Black feminist lens to look at topics in the writing classroom. Uh, and then we'll kind of wind it up. Brittany has written at the close of the book a benediction that I think is really a nice way to close us out. What I do want to encourage, in addition to this conversation that we'll have going, though, is uh, you putting questions in the chat. Uh, Brittany and I are both eager to um, see what you have to, to ask and contribute to the discussion. And I just really will encourage all of us to think of it that way, very much as a conversation. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see all of your lovely faces. And uh, Brittany, my first question for you is this. When you first heard the term eloquent rage from one of your students in connection with your teaching, you had a somewhat defensive reaction to it. Tell us about how that changed and why you now come to think of it as your superpower. Yeah, thank you, Joy. Um, thank you to the McMillan team. Uh, hey, everybody, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining in on a Friday afternoon. Um, so I was teaching Black women writers. I was uh, finishing up um, the doctorate uh, at Emory University. And my, my doctoral advisor, I was initially a TA for this course, and my doctoral advisor got sick in the middle of the semester, and I had to pinch hit uh, and take over this Black women writers course. And so, you know, I was trying to figure out who I was as an instructor and all of those things in the class. And 
super self-conscious. And so apparently it went okay because many months later, one of the students in that class um, saw me and, you know, just said, I used to love to listen to you lecture uh, because your lectures were filled with rage, but it was like the most eloquent rage ever. And I was immediately defensive in the way that Black women always are when there's this sort of attribution of anger, right? When we think we're just doing our thing. And I said, you know, I'm not angry, I'm passionate, you know, because that's the response that we've been you know, that is our defensive response. And my student, who was also a Black woman, young Black woman, said, Brittany, <laughs> you know you're angry, right? Uh, and I felt uh, chastised and called out because it was a very much a Black woman, I see you kind of moment, like you're not fooling anyone. But what was helpful in the construction was that she said, you know, that that the lectures were good for her, that she learned the material, that the what she felt in the rage was a sort of authenticity of emotion, a connection to the material. Uh, and so she felt that there, I think that what I heard in what she was saying was the sense that I could show up in the classroom and be my full self and still be rigorous, uh, still be training students, still be committed to the material and delivering the information, but that I didn't have to do that as though thinking and talking about the harrowing stories that we were reading about in a course like that, that, that those that I was disconnected or dispassionate about the material, right, which is sometimes the affect that we think professors ought to have that to be objective uh, or to do Black studies or to do Black literary studies is to act as though reading Black women's harrowing tales across history and reading about their struggles don't affect us, when of course they do. So it allowed me to see my rage as a thing that powered the rigor of the work that I do rather than something that limited the rigor of the work that I do. Thank you very much. Uh, I have an excerpt that I'm, I'm hoping you can read. We'll do this uh, a couple times just for everyone's expectations. Uh, but this, this next piece that Brittany's going to read, I feel kind of really uh, talks about the goals of the book um, in the context of America as a homegirl in need of intervention. So Brittany, if you can, can you see my screen? Yes, I got it. Okay. Do you mind reading this page? Sure. America needs a homegirl intervention in the worst way. So in this book, I'm doing what Black women do best. I'm calling America out on her bullshit about racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm using feminism to stage this homegirl intervention. I'm here for picket signs, pussy hats, as long as there are plenty of brown ones in the mix, and patchouli. My picket signs are as likely to say fuck the police as they are to say fuck the patriarchy. Black girl feminism is all the rage and we need all the rage. Feminism can give us a common language for thinking about how sexism and racism and classism work together to fuck shit up for everybody. Like many other feminists, I used to carry around Audre Lorde's book Sister Outsider like it was the feminist bible. Her essay, The Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism, taught me that rage is a legitimate political emotion. She writes, focused with precision, it can become a powerful source of energy serving progress and change. Here's the thing. My anger and rage haven't always been focused with precision. The process of both becoming a feminist and becoming okay with rage as a potential feminist superpower has been messy as hell. We need to embrace our messiness more. We need to embrace the ways we are in process more. Very often, Black girls don't get the opportunity to be in process. So just know that you don't have to have everything figured out to read and enjoy this book. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, that's great. Um, and I'll just let that soak in a little bit for everybody if this is the first time you're, you're hearing. Uh, I would strongly encourage you, if you've not yet read Brittany's book, to check out the audio version because she reads it herself. And I think that's a, a wonderful experience. Um, okay, so in addition to the way you've, you've so wonderfully summarized uh, some of your goals of the book, Brittany, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you could just share for the group how in this book you're either defining or perhaps redefining intersectional feminism. Yeah, let me say a couple of things. One is, I know that for some folks in the, you know, even though we're in college classrooms that all of the cussing is off-putting, but y'all know that kids love it when we cuss because it makes us human, right, for them. And also I cuss like a sailor and it's like my resistance to the way that respectability politics gets imposed upon Black women in the classroom. And so I just like to tell people, like, I'm not trying to be a fucking lady. And so you know that pretty much coming into the game. Um, and so it's also a great way to disrupt this idea that rigor or literariness needs to sound a particular way. Um, 
you know, the other thing I would say too about that passage is that I think it's actually really apt for the kinds of things that we're trying to do when we're trying to help our students to become better writers, which is to recognize the way that it's about being in process. And so it's literally about the, the learning, the, the discipline of drafting and revision, right? Uh, and not being self-satisfied with the first version of the thing that you turn in. Uh, you know, and as I tell my students all the time, particularly my grad students who I do more writing instruction with these days. Um, but I say usually your best idea is in the last line of the first draft of this essay, right? And so start there when you get ready to write the, the second draft. Uh, and so I, so part of what it means to be a writer for me is coming to recognize what it means to actually sit in the messiness of the process and also then recognizing that that teaches a lesson for our students too and it creates a sort of context for empathy as we try to relate to our students and try to show them that like learning this thing about writing learning the ways in which the words don't just show up on the page the perfect the first time you have to practice you have to get good at grammar good at mechanics you have to learn how to integrate different styles sentence leaks all of all of those things that make writing pop um, that you're also particularly at the stage that we encounter students learning that about your life what are your politics what are the things that you care about who should be your friend groups right how are you going to sort of who do you want to be in the world um, and so this book, I think, tries to stage an encounter between both of those kinds of things. Um, and it's informed then to Joy's question by intersectional perspectives. I am a Black feminist scholar, an intellectual historian, a theorist. That's the nerdiest part of what I do. Um, and I define intersectionality in the way that Kimberly Crenshaw defined it 30 years ago, which is um, about understanding the way that systems of power intersect to actually constrain life chances for people across different axes. So um, certainly that means something for what it means to be a Black woman in the world, a Black girl in the world, but also to be a person of color in the world. Part of the challenge in this book, though, and it's a thing that I'm always working through as a scholar, um, is how to render really complex academic ideas in very accessible ways that don't feel like a dumbing down to one's audience. Um, and so in this book, I try to think about what the intimate outcomes of intersection, like of intersectional lives looks like. So it's one thing to sit in a classroom and say, let's think about racism and sexism and classism and sexuality and all those things as multiplicative systems of power. It's another thing to think about, well, how did that affect my day today, navigating the world as a Black girl? And what is the baggage that I come home with that I have to shed or that I have to think through or that I have to fortify myself against um, as I'm navigating the world? And so I, I think the personal, um, you know, it's the old feminist, you know, edict of the personal is political. But I think that helping people to, to tap into the idea that all of the stuff that we're thinking about in the classroom has a personal impact on how we live, both in terms of like what our politics are, but also in terms of how we are affected by the structures of power that we're trying so mightily to understand. Definitely. And, and I'm curious to know, you, you, kind, of, you kind of qualify uh, this discussion of intersectionality by saying, if you say fuck the patriarchy, but you don't ride for other women, then it might be more true that the patriarchy has fucked you, seducing you with the belief that men care more about your well-being than women do. It simply isn't true. Yeah. Um, you know, I try to have some of the harder conversations because I'm interested not just in what feminism means theoretically, but what does it look like for us to actually be, be feminist in practice, right? Uh, and so in the end in this book, I ultimately tell, you know, people that feminism means unapologetically loving women, right? Um, and I have a, I am bothered when I meet women who say things like, you know, I'm not friends with other women because you can't trust them or they're competitive or they're too catty or, you know, I'm, you know, I'm more of a guy's kind of girl. I relate to guys more. Um, it feels to me like internalized patriarchy. It feels to me like the opposite of what we need to be thinking and doing. It's part of a feminist revolution. And I was really writing 
out of the lessons I learned from middle school, basically through college, about how to navigate the world um, as among Black girls, particularly among when I was a kid, you know, being with, you know, sort of thrown into friend groups with Black girls, largely because we were like honor students in predominantly white schools. And so there would only be a few of us and we didn't necessarily get along, but also there was us against the world. And so we had to figure out what did it mean to be friends with each other and have each other's backs when in a more free world, we might have chosen people with different affinities altogether. Um, and part of that was learning about how to hold each other's tough parts, about learning how to like sort of relate across really complicated and complex interactions. Um, and I also wanted to disrupt this kind of foregoing cultural narrative about Black womanhood, that we don't know how to relate to each other, that we fight and scrap. I mean, it's the thing that drives reality television shows, and people love to watch Black women in these dysfunctional relationships. And that hasn't been the nature of my relationships with Black women. I have a homegirl squad. We roll deep. Uh, we roll through the academy together. And that ethic was something that was cultivated for me very young and that I have navigated for, you know, in both better and worse ways over my life, but which I think is the core, like, I don't like the sort of underhanded backbiting stuff that sometimes happens between women. And so how do you both call that out and think about that as a function of a structural system that pits us against each other, rather than thinking about that as like personal or gender pathology? Um, one more thing uh, about the book. Uh, we talked about the in intersectionality of, of Blackness, of feminism. It also seems important to you in this book to connect those topics with spirituality. So I wonder if you could talk to us about what grown woman theology is. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I am from the Deep South. I grew up in the church. I'm a preacher's kid. Uh, I'm a preacher, like, you know, in a whole other part of my world. And so um, I wanted folks to be able to think very progressively about these issues. One of the things that I really struggled with in college was how to integrate my faith with all of the new information that I was learning in, in class, right? And family demands to sort of stay committed to a particular theological perspective and also just being totally seduced and intrigued and you know by the kids who were irreverent and asked questions because I've always been a skeptic as well and um and so this was my attempt to write to a particular kind of black girl in that section who um who is really trying to figure out around particularly around sexuality and so I say some very body and sort of challenging things uh, for very conservative Christians around how to have a sexual politics and ethics that is far more healthy. And I talk, my grandmother um, is the, is the sort of driving character in that, in that chapter, uh, in that chapter staged based on a conversation that I had with my grandmother, where she basically, you know, said to me one time, like, it's time for you to start having sex. Like I was a year out of college and I went to see her and, you know, I'm walking up on the porch and, you know, black older Black ladies do this thing where they read you when you have not consented to be read. Uh, and that was sort of her intervention that day, like disarming me. Um, it's just a very funny story now, but it was very disconcerting to me at the time. And then I work backwards from there and sort of think about the history of how we come to our sexual attitudes, uh, you know, in a particular Black girl perspective. And then, you know, how to use a kind of feminist lens to think about what that perspective forecloses and what does it mean to try to live in both worlds and try to try to be integrative and i really try to advocate for like a healthier approach and basically to say it's against any claim to liberation that i know to have a set of theological perspectives that performs the same kind of violences on our intimate lives that we saw slavery performing 150 years ago um, or that we see white supremacy and racism performing today so you know, I try to have, you know, it is both an attempt, like a love letter to Black girls who struggle in the way that I did. It's the kind of book and chapter that I wish I had had in college as I was navigating all of these different things. And that was said to me in a register that I could hear it from somebody who was an insider and knew that language, but also had the sort of requisite ability to like disrupt it. Um, and so, 
Yeah, you know, I mean, the other thing I'll say too, as a scholar, is that I'm really interested in how to model for our students that we get to show up as all of the people that we are. I don't show up in my church lady self a whole lot in the classroom uh, because, you know, Christianity is problematic and, you know, is a sort of privileged position. And I don't need to be a sort of not all Christians kind of Christian, you know, trying to prove, you know, trying to virtue signal that like, I'm not like the others, you know, I'm not interested in that, right? I'm much more interested in that part of my life and having, intervening conversations with people in the church so that they can stop being so violent. And particularly in the black church, the white church, I've sort of, you know, discarded it. Um, but the, you know, but at the same time, here's the thing that I have found to be really interesting. Every time if I say anything about religion, like usually it'll be a bullet point in a lecture or, uh, you know, passing discussion in graduate seminar and students always want to have that discussion, right? Like they always are like, wait a minute. Like, I want to talk about this God thing. I want to talk about this Christianity thing. I want to talk about, and I'm like, wait, like I'm trying not to do that. We don't do that in the secular academy, right? And like, they always want to do it. It's so, uh, it's so interesting. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, it just felt important to show up. And look, the last thing I want to say about that is in this political moment, I actually don't really rock with the like academic left performance of cynicism. It just feels foreign to me. Um, and it feels foreign to me because I'm a working class black woman who, you know, or I'm not working class now, but I was a working class black girl who is a first generation college graduate. Uh, and to know what that journey is and to recognize that to have the sort of journey that I've had is to have to have faith in a world that you cannot see from the place that you begin. And so the idea that I would like discard some notion of faith or hope um, because it feels more intellectually rigorous to do so feels, um, you know, that feels dishonest in terms of the kinds of resources that have gotten me to this point in my life, so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vivian, do we have any questions so far? Yeah, so uh, one question we have is, um, how have colleagues responded to eloquent rage versus, let's say, personal connections in your life responding to the text? Yeah, you know, it is. it has actually been uh, embraced really widely. When I wrote Eloquent, I didn't, you know, I already had written a sort of, you know, traditional academic monograph for tenure. And this book was really an elevation of the kind of public work that I was already doing on the Crunk Feminist Collective blog and writing in some of the national outlets that I wrote in or write in. Uh, and I didn't expect it to be embraced by academe in any signif significant way because of the you know way in which the text sometimes reads as conversational, because of my investment and translation for broader audiences, which is often seen as a lesser kind of knowledge production um, in, you know, very traditional academic spaces. But I, I would argue that eloquent rage is being taught more broadly in college classrooms than beyond respectability is. In fact, I know it is. Um, and, you know, so often colleagues just tell me that it's the thing that helps students to get on board with what a lived feminism can look like. And it also helps them to understand these more complex concepts. I've had people with PhDs, particularly who are not PhDs in the humanities, email me and say, like, I didn't ever get this feminism thing. And then I read this book and now I both understand it and find it relevant to my life. Um, and so I consider that a win, right? And also like an indictment of us as academics in the way that our own investment and in sort of performing for each other has meant that we aren't always talking to the folks who most need to hear the things that we are saying. Um, and so, I, you know, this book is being taught to undergrad students and grad students and, you know, and I've had so many colleagues to embrace it as well. Um, and personally, yeah, like, you know, my mom read it. I had her, I tell part of my mother's story in this book. And so I had her permission to do that. Um, I wouldn't have done some of the truth, some of the personal re re uh, revelatory sort of things that I share, uh, I wouldn't have shared without her permission. And so she read it. Um, and, you know, she's just, you know, and she told me like, I laughed, I cried, I, you know, and she was like, it just reminded me of 
you know, in her words, well, she said two things. One, you know, in some parts of it where I talk and think about childhood, she says, I wish I'd been more tender, which um, is so interesting because I didn't, I didn't write it as a critique of her. Um, and then, you know, in other parts, she said, you know, we had to struggle so hard to be decent people. And by that, I think she means just so many layers of accreted kind of structural privation to overcome. Uh, and so the fact that my mama's proud and that she deeply engaged with this book and felt like it was a book she could open. And I mean, my mother is a reader, an avid reader, but I don't know that my first book is the kind of book that uh, anybody in my family would want to read. And this book, you know, folks have picked it up and they've read it. And that that is a, a huge testament to me that I did my work. Great. Thanks, Vivian. Anything else in the questions so far? Not yet, but definitely, I know we're in a listening mode right now because Bernie's saying such great stuff. But if you, as the talk is progressing, you have any questions, enter them in the chat and I will ask them or feel free to unmute yourself. Great. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we'll move into part two of our conversation. Uh, this is where I was uh, hoping to hear a little bit of Brittany's perspective on uh, eloquent rage in this political moment, if you will. Um, but maybe before that, okay, <laughs> Delisa, I'm thinking, question yeah, come in go ahead. I can ask it. Let's do that. Go ahead. What advice do you have for young academics who want to produce public scholarship slash more accessible scholarship in the vein of eloquent rage? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, I think two things. One is you got to decide what your professional goals are. And what I like to tell people is, um, you know, we have a, a whole new crop of younger scholars, newer academics who are like, oh yeah, I just, you know, I want to write for trade publications. I want to write for major outlets, um, you know, and they're less interested in monographs. Tenure in my field and many other fields is still based on monographs and articles. So if tenure is your goal, you've got to prioritize that. Um, you've got to make sure that you're doing that kind of work because I can't see yet. We keep saying that we're shifting some institutions are shifting, but I haven't actually structurally seen a huge shift, not at the assistant to associate level. But for me, I didn't wait until I got tenure to do public scholarship. We started the Crunk Feminist Collective blog my first year on the tenure track. Um, and I was mostly anonymous there until it sort of became a, a, a thing, a, like a, a, you know, a minor feminist phenomena. And then I went public uh, with my writing so that I, people would not claim credit for my work. Um, I wrote for Salon. I had a national weekly column for a couple of years while I was on the tenure track. I did television while I was on the tenure track. But the thing that I need people to know about that is that I was, so when my tenure packet went in, it I had ex far exceeded the bounds of like what the institution asked for because I wanted to be able to do both things, right? I didn't want there to be any questions about my tenure case. And I also wanted to produce scholarship accessibly. And there are a lot of younger scholars who think that one takes the place of the other. And I would just say to you that in my experience of it thus far, I think it should change. I'm on a committee at Rutgers that like is rewriting and reimagining tenure guidelines, but it hasn't fully changed yet. So there's that, um, is to really think about what your goals are uh, in terms of doing the public work. The second thing I would say uh, is that you really need to think, like, because you're writers, I, I find it interesting when people sort of want to write for the public and have not practiced or built, you know, have not, so, you know, so like being able to do a deal like the deal I did with Macmillan with St. Martin's, I was able to do that deal because I had been writing in public for a really long time, writing for free for f several years and then writing to get paid for several years, which is to say I had been practicing the craft of figuring out how to communicate complex ideas to general audiences for a really long time. What has happened now is that people just see the sort of trade book as the next stage of like an academic life. And a lot of people haven't done the practice or the work to actually be able to write for a general audience. And it's, and that is in part because of an academic arrogance that says that if we can write academically, then obviously we could do this lesser form. And it's like, it's not a lesser form. It's a different form and it's its own craft. 
Um, but I also would say, like, if you have something to say, go for it. Pitch, you know, take a media workshop where you learn how to pitch outlets, you know, pitching the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Atlantic or, you know, other kinds of sites where you want to write. Go ahead and learn to pitch. Do podcasts, do radio interviews. When newspapers call you and want your perspective on something, take those interviews. They are evidence of public scholarship and they give you practice in honing what critical perspective you have in the world. Um, and, you know, finally, I, I think people have to have a more expansive view of what they think public scholarship is because unfortunately, many younger scholars think public scholarship is being on television or getting six-figure book deals or writing in the most major publications. But I did a whole like 10 years probably nearly of doing a lot of that. like, look, everything that I do isn't on television. You know, I talk to high school kids. I talk, I just got an invitation to talk to a fraternity group. I'm gonna go talk to them about their politics around black womanhood. You know, I talk to church groups like, you know, there's so to be a public scholar is to be a community engaged scholar. Right. And to be having the conversations with the people that you want to talk to. It is not to be a celebrity scholar. So I feel, I feel like folks have to have a really expansive notion about who, who is it that you want to be because to, to do this other thing, to do a version of the thing I do and that some others do. Um, is both wonderful and exciting, and you absolutely can be in conversations you never imagined you could be in, uh, but it also comes with its own set of pressures, uh, and you have to balance it if you want to have an enduring relationship with an academic institution. Now, if you don't, if you want to, like, have a full-time career as a trade writer, then A, you don't need to you don't need a, pr a prior academic career to get there. And B, if what you want to be is famous and on the television, you also don't need a PhD to do that. So, like, that, you know, um, so I, I have mixed, uh, you know, sort of mixed feelings mostly around do it and because we need the voices, uh, we very much need them and also respect the craft. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Jaleesa, for the question. Uh, two quick comments. Yeah. What a delicious way to end our conference. I'm gulping every word. I cannot wait to listen to the book. So there's one. And thank you. This is an amazing conversation. So please continue. Great. Uh, so, uh, Brittany, you've been talking about uh, your role in public scholarship, and this is a good segue uh, to something that I listened to recently, actually on Monday this week. You and Dr. Eddie Gloud, he's at Princeton, you were part of a conversation on NPR's 1A, and you were talking about the impact of whiteness on the election. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, can you talk about your observations leading up to and since the election re results were announced, and why the calls to unite the country under President-elect Biden might be problematic? Yeah, um, I mean, many things. It's a big question. So let me just take off a chunk of it and say, uh, I don't want to be unified with the 70 million people who think that Trump is a viable option. I'm a Black woman uh, from the South living in a place, uh, living up North in a place where I have seen videos of Trump caravans in my own backyard. And there's like a street in my neighborhood where if you ride down the street, one side they have Biden flags on all the houses and the other side they have like Trump flags on all the houses. And that's in a blue state because I live in New Jersey. And so it's super insane and it feels unsafe. And um, and so anybody who thinks that that madman, you know, fascist in training, you know, sort of asp aspiring autocrat, uh, is somebody who they want to pin their, you know, sort of hopes and futures on. Um, I, I have no desire for unity from them or with them. I also do a lot of work in movement. I tell people I'm an active participant in the movement for Black Lives, an active supporter, um, have been since 2013 when Trayvon Martin was killed and 2014 when Michael Brown was killed. That informs my teaching and my public work. Um, and so I am more to the left of Biden and Harris. Um, and I think we sort of have to figure out two kinds of things. One is I'm bothered by the left sanctimony of academic spaces, because clearly at the point that Biden was the nominee, then we all needed to fully get on board with voting for him. And there's a way sometimes that academics can poison the waters with our critiques, right? And we don't always use our powers 
for good in the sense that we don't always clarify the stakes for people in the proper ways. And so there is a way that if we're not careful, we can actually teach classes and turn out students who think that there's no appreciable difference between, say, a, a Biden and a Trump, right, or a Hillary Clinton and a Trump, or there's no difference between, um, you know, uh, like, I mean, yeah, typically we don't make good distinctions on the left. Uh, or the right, you know, or that there's no distinctions even between like a Trump and a, and a George W. Bush, just for instance. And there are clear distinctions and there are substantive distinctions and there are distinctions that matter. And we can say, well, I'm not a centrist and, you know, I'm not a liberal. I'm a radical, I'm a leftist, I'm a whatever. Uh, but we still have to teach with a certain level of integrity. And I feel like, you know, I feel like some of my colleagues don't always do that. And that bothers me and it bothers me in part because that failure, particularly in the places, you know, we got past it this time, but in 2016, it hamstrung us and led us to like, you know, we think that we've redeemed ourselves because we have elected Biden, but we will be undoing the, the trauma that Trump has done for four years. And can we really say that because we got it, you know, more right this time than we did last time, we can't atone for the kids that have been traumatized and separated from their families and locked in cages. There is no atonement for the level of generational trauma that we have caused. We can't atone for the way that we have unleashed a full-fledged spirit of white supremacy in this country that seeks actively and vocally to terrorize Black folks uh, and to terrorize Brown folks and to sort like engage in Islamophobia. We have had a, a, a vocal Muslim ban in the country for four years. Like, we that level of violence and trauma that we have done to anybody who is not white in this country and not rich and not powerful we can't fully atone for that um and we don't do sometimes i what i try to do in the courses that i'm teaching is teach students to hold complexity, which is why writing is so important, because it's only when you write through a set of problems and you have to think in a complex manner about what you are talking about, that you begin to see the real nuances and differences of a thing, because as we all know, we don't allow our students to proselytize on the page, right? It isn't a sermon. You know, it is like a, you know, it is a, like a critical sort of engagement. And I, you know, I, I think that's, um, I think that's important. And so so I don't want to be unified with, with Trump folks, but I also am not looking forward to the specter of Biden, who sees himself as a great unifier, subjecting us to centrism over the next four years, when, because I do think the other challenge of this moment is that we might lose all of the momentum for progressive movements, right? I do think it's a failure of the Democratic Party that we had the most progressive and diverse uh, primary field that we've ever seen. And that we ended up at the end with two old white guys. And one of them, you know, just continues to think he can unify folks. And I think he's going to find the challenging edge of that when people keep on looking at his black woman vice president, because he's an old man, he might not make it past one term, and then she's the putative nominee. Uh, and I, I think it becomes super interesting to think about how deeply people's racism and sexism is going to influence and shape what they think is possible. And so part of what I'm saying is I think that Biden has to throw his lot in if he were smart and if he didn't have a bunch of Clinton era people around him, right? Um, I think he would throw his lot in with young progressive voters of color. They are the future. They have the energy. They can drive the party to the left. And if you give them something to vote for, beyond scaring the shit out of them, they will actually show up and do it. And I think movements have taught us that, uh, you know, and, you know, and I think we also have, just like, look, here's the last thing I'm gonna say about this. One of the things we have to do, like we have to do in our classrooms, I tell students all the time, whenever I'm trying to get them to debate with a text rather than like just accept it on its face, I say, well, you don't have to concede the terms in which it frames the debate. Do you actually agree with that framing, that definition, that question? Should we ask a different question? Should we, you know, does that terminology do the thing that we're trying to do? Like, you know, actually have a challenge to the thing you're reading. And we've also got to begin to do that in politics and recognize that we don't have to, you know, sort of just march to the right because we, we feel like we can't marshal a kind of progressive vision in this country. We don't just have to concede the terms of the right. Um, 
we have to figure out what it means to actually frame our position in ways that are more compelling. Uh, and, you know, and part of the challenge sometimes is this centrist stuff is all about conceding the terms upon which white people understand the universe, right? White people, you know, whether more liberal, <laughs> more left of center or more right of center, all of, all of this election has been about restoring a status quo that feels comfortable for white people. It hasn't been about making black people more comfortable in the aggregate, right? And so even though the Biden side of that has won, he doesn't want too much change. He just doesn't want the fascists to win. And that's a really different thing than saying, I want to see democracy massively expanded for all who would come, right, and be a participant. And I think we have to really understand that as being different. And so this is also why liberals, are, white liberals are so dangerous to the rest of us, because they just want a restoration of a status quo in which we acknowledge that system, st systemic racism exists, but we don't actually make any bold changes to actually do anything about it. But they want the sort of the cookies for saying, we acknowledge that this is a problem, but we don't actually want to risk anything to change it in, in the aggregate, right? And that's a liberal position, right? Um, and so what Black people voted for in this election was like, We'll take that status quo over the fascist as well, because we know how to maneuver within that status quo. But that's certainly not the freedom vision that these kids we're teaching have. And they're going to force us to really reckon with our own comfort with, you know, with mediocrity in terms of what democracy could actually be. Uh, and that's why we need them so bad. Yeah. So just a follow up question to that. Um, in light of this, should we be reservedly or decidedly enthusiastic about the fact that the first female who will become vice president is a woman of color? Yeah, look, I'm excited. I mean, look, I'm, I'm excited in part because Kamala Harris is a graduate of Howard University, which is my alma mater, and we're insufferable uh, about <laughs> our graduates, our alumna uh, and alumni. So I'm proud of her. Uh, I'm also, she wasn't my first choice. I tell people that all the time. I was a Warren chick. I liked Elizabeth Warren. You know, her professor wonkiness really appealed to me, right? Um, but such as, such as it is, um, I think Kamala will do a great job. I Look, I, and, and, and let me qualify that because I know it like sets people on edge. They auditioned to run the American empire. It's a violent colonial, settler colonial project on its face. That's what they auditioned to do revolutionaries don't run empires which is also the thing i have to say to my sanders people like revolutionaries don't run empires dude it's it's literally uh antithetical to 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 the project and so let's like actually again not concede the terms that any of these people are offering to us um I think representation matters. I'm not with a sort of new turn and among some like among the woke study set this says that because representation is everything, isn't everything that it isn't, that it is therefore nothing. I disagree with that. I know that part of the, the, the sort of clearest evidence of patriarchy is the fact that up until, up until last Tuesday, we didn't ever think a woman was qualified to sit in the first or second position in this country. And we've been a country for nearly 250 years. That is a, a, a bulwark of patriarchy. Like, that's what it is. And the fact that we have a more radical feminist perspective among many of us that is anti-capitalist, that asks us to seriously sort of reckon with our relationship to the nation state, doesn't change the fact that a more liberal feminist vision often is the gateway to the more radical things we want to achieve. And if people won't even concede that a woman can run it, then what are we talking about, right? And so that then frustrates me with people on the far left who then say things like, well, wanting representation is a bourgeois demand. How can you say that to Black people who have had to fight for every scrap of representation in this country that we have gotten? That is an insult. And we never argue that representation meant representation over substance, right? We have said that that white people have gotten there because they were white, not because they were meritorious. And that if you actually make these systems more equal, then when you consider black people on the merits, we will rise to the top as well. Not consider us because we are black, but rather take away the barriers that have allowed you not to 
assume the idea that Black people could, in fact, be meritorious for positions, right? So this is also the thing, again, that we've got to teach our students about not conceding the terms, because anytime I teach affirmative action anything in classes, I got kids across the board, across color, across class, who who are like, well, I don't want to get anything, or I do consulting, do D&I consulting work. You know, I don't want this because I'm a woman. I don't want this because I'm Black. You know, I don't want people to focus on the fact that I'm a Black person doing X or I'm a woman doing X. Why not? Given the way that people think, like, we have to intervene in the idea that women can't do things or that Black folks can't do things, right? Or that immigrant folks can't do things, right? And, like, given that, like, given those clear biases, I'm happy to hold the banner of being a Black woman doing whatever the thing is that people don't think Black women should do. And I think it matters that Kamala is a Black woman. I think the challenge for her, though, is that she's going to have an impossible position. She's going to have to tamp down her ambition and be the, you know, the, the second in command to a white man and make him look good, even though she's more progressive than him. She's not progressive enough for the sort of left wing of the party that has lots of young people of color. So they already hate her and distrust her in ways that they are refused to acknowledge are not only about principle and ideology, but they're actually also about misogyny, right? Because we don't hold any other group of people to the standards that we hold women and people of color to. We let white men get away with being mediocre all the time. And then there's an impossible bar when you're a woman or a person of color to jump over. You have to be perfect. You have to be pure or people act like it actually is odious for them to sit at the table with you and that is rooted in a kind of misogyny uh, and then she's gonna be the chief diversity officer for the nation when that is not actually the job she wanted right so she's gonna have to like diversify and be the pop of color in all the pictures and stuff and endure people being like yeah black women are equal now right when none of that is true uh, and, you know, and when what she wanted to do was be seen as the formidable commander in chief of the country and positioned to do that job. And we all know that very often when universities bring in these chief diversity officers, they, they often work in roles that are about covering the university's ass, not always positioned to make real change. Uh, and so she is going to have to really slug it out through some hard positionings to figure out how to actually be impactful in ways that don't piss off everybody uh, so she can be positioned to lead if the, you know, if the opportunity arises. Yeah, not, not a small task before her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to shift gears a little bit just in the interest of, of uh, time and also topically uh, to talk a little bit with, with our colleagues on this call about the writing classroom and the opportunities it affords us to um, to look at things through the lens of Black feminism. So, uh, Brittany, I'm going to share my screen. You wrote this beautiful passage that I'm going to ask you to read. Um, and you, uh, yeah, I don't want to spoil it here. I just need to pull up my screen. Hold on. Okay, let's see. Uh, hold on a second. There it is. Okay. Would you mind reading this passage, please? Sure. Curiosity is often the first casualty of the politics of fear. Sometimes the things we fear most are our questions. More specifically, we fear the questions to which we don't have answers. When we are afraid, we stop asking questions and start seeking short-term solutions. The work of my hands is the work of teaching students how to ask more and better questions. It is the work of rescuing curiosity from the clutches of fear. What kind of world can white fear really create? What is the end game of white supremacy? And what would it mean to start from the fears of the marginalized and build a world that is safe for them? The question I have, uh, based on what you're saying here about the work of my hands, uh, to teach students to question more, to question better, how does the lens of Black feminism create possibility in the writing classroom, given the emphasis there on things like reflection, revision, and examining and re-examining texts? Yeah, um, it's a great question. One, I think that part of what good writing does is it calls you into a space of empathy, you know, because you have to try to think about and relate to the to the experience of someone else on the page. And so much of the kind of structure of feeling out of which Black feminism grows is about combating a kind of invisibility. Uh, it is about um, 
co combating a like structurally imposed invisibility, the outgrowth of which or the result of which is a lack of empathy for struggles that we don't, you know, that other people might not share. Uh, and so I think that when we say that we want students to be reflective, when we say that we want students to sort of dig into a text, part of what an intersectional framework and a, like a black feminist orientation to text does is ask us to think, you know, on a, mo on a range of different registers. It asks us to think culturally, politically, uh, personally about what are the structures in place that have allowed me not to see other groups of people who are not like me? What are the things that I don't already know, but that I presume that I did know? Like it's an epistemological question that Black feminism raises about what are the kinds of knowledge that are foreclosed, depending on how we are structurally positioned. Um, but there's also, you know, I, I think that it also asks students to recognize that part of the reason that they have to show up to the page and to the work is because Black feminism believes in situated knowledge is that our social location determines what we do know and what we can know and what we can contribute. Uh, and I think that that means that there is space made for students to feel like their personal experiences actually do matter. Um, part of the reason that I came to embrace Black feminism, which is a journey that I talk a bit about in this book, uh, is because it was in a Black feminist classroom that I saw professors teaching in a way that made space for me to be fully myself. And so I didn't have to show up to the classroom and feel like mastering the way in which white people learned or white text was the only thing that I was there to do or even the primary thing. And so I could bring the things my grandmother taught me into the classroom. I could bring the things my mother taught me. I could bring what it meant to be a working class, small town girl uh, into the classroom with me, as opposed to seeing my educational journey as you know, shedding the baggage of all of that stuff and seeing it only as baggage and not as being like, um, intellectually legitimate or profound or interesting or worthy of mining for material. And so Black feminism does that because it values the things that other people would discard, the things and people, the experiences and perspectives that others would discard. Um, so I think that I, I've seen so many students across my more than decade of teaching who, whether they are Black or otherwise, see themselves in Black feminist text. See their, you know, here was the thing that was really funny. Like over the last couple of years that this book has been out, white women will tweet me often and they'll be like, this book was not written for me, but I just really related to it a whole lot. And, you know, it's both a compliment, but it also makes me laugh. And so after this had happened, you know, a few hundred times, I wrote back and I said, I mean, Black people read books that are not about us all the time and relate to them. Like, why are you so surprised that a book that is about a Black woman's own experiences wouldn't have anything for you to relate to in it? And what do you mean this book is not for me? I don't put, pick up any book and think this book wasn't written for me. I mean, I work from the presumption that most books weren't written for me, right? But, you know, part of what it means to be like a Black student in the world is that you are forced to sort of think about other texts as universal. And then when people come to your book, they don't see you as having universal potential. They see you as being so deeply particular that they are really shocked when it's like, oh, Black women struggle with that thing too? Yeah, because we're human beings, right? And so, <laughs> you know, that that is both a bit of funny and a delightful outcome of this book that I also think is like incredibly important for students is yeah, read a book that is not about you and then realize the thing that all other Black kids and kids of color learn in this country as we read classic text after classic canonical text, which is that you can learn from any book, right? And that there are things about the human experience. Maybe, you know, maybe it is a particular experience, but then it helps you to understand how particular your own experience is, how your experience is not in fact universal because there are other people who encounter these same texts, cultural texts and moments in different ways. For instance, you know, anyone who knows me knows that I love the Babysitter's Club. I grew up reading those books. I devoured those books. You know, it's a Netflix series now. I devoured the series, right? I mean, I love the Babysitter's Club. And you know, it's like, like white women being like, you love the babysitters? Well, first of all, there weren't any serious books about black girls when I was a kid. So like, yeah, as a girl who loved to read, who else was I going to read but Beverly Cleary and Judy Bloom and Ann Martin? I was going to read the same people y'all were going to read, right? 
So, you know, so it's like this surprising thing. And I, you know, and it just occurs to me all the time that like, you know, so for so many of my white, even, I had lots of white friends as a kid and, you know, it just never occurred to them that like there was also a black girl somewhere sitting at home devouring these, these books too. Uh, and, you know, so that, so I think that that becomes a powerful lesson for our students around what does it mean to write out of the particularity of your experience and what is learning, how is your world expanded when you get to encounter the other worlds of people um, and, you know, and see them fully as human and not as caricature in the way that they so often emerge, right? And so uh, that's what I hope Eloquent does. Yeah. I like one comment in the chat uh, saying, I would say I learn more when the book is not about me. And I, I think that's very telling, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would invite questions before we move into the benediction, because we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, so and you can I want to share you, something if I may, Joy. Oh yeah, go ahead, Vivian. Sorry. No, yeah. When you were saying that whole thing about expectations, I, I don't know if you had seen it. And I think it was at the Academy Awards. They did a recording of uh, the Pakistani comedian Kumail Nanjiani. And he was talking about, I've watched movies about white people my entire life. So somebody could watch a movie about my life now and see my experience. And when you said that, that clip immediately jumped into my head and I thought, yep, that makes perfect sense. That's it. That, that, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, yeah, it's just so, I mean, I had a, you know, fairly prominent white woman leader say to me, she was like, this book like allows me to eavesdrop on conversations between black women that I never get, you know, that they won't let us in the room to hear. And I was like, okay, whatever works. Right. It's, it's so like, I wasn't offended. I was amused, but I also was like, are black women a mystery to people? This is interesting. And it's interesting for me as a theorist, right? Because everyone assumes that they know what motivates black women, or they assume that nothing motivates us. That's worthy of investigation. Right. So the, the idea that like you that you eavesdrop and learn that there are these rich interior lives and struggles for this group of people that you depend on to save your democracy btw right <laughs> uh, you know that they actually might be thinking and talking about things that are like relevant to just the human project um you know, I have found that conversation just so amusing, but also delightful to be a part of like helping to break it open along with a spate of other texts uh, by Black women writers. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to share my screen one more time. And Brittany, if you don't mind, I will ask you to read the benediction that comes at the end of the book. Okay. <laughs> May you have joy. Joy, as I've heard countless Black preachers say, is different from happiness because happiness is predicated on happenings, on what's occurring, on whether your life is going right and whether all is well. Joy arises from an internal clarity about our purpose. My purpose is justice, and the fight for justice brings me joy. In your president's favorite book of the Bible, 2 Corinthians, these words appear. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. In shorter form, the Black church would say, joy, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Maintaining the capacity for joy is critical to the struggle for justice. Things are still as fucked up at the end of this book as they were at the beginning, but we can't let the messed up state of the world steal our joy. It is critical in reinvigorating our capacity for new visions. When we lack joy, we have a diminished capacity for self-love and self-valuing and for empathy. If political struggle is, is exercised for the soul, joy is the endorphin rush such struggles bring. May you have gut-busting belly laughter every day. Laughing with my girls brings me joy. Traveling around the world, migrating down south to my mama's sofa, watching Food Network for hours, reading trashy romance novels and watching sappy rom-coms all of these things bring me joy. Yes, I know they reinforce the patriarchy. You win some, you lose some. May you ask more and better questions. Homegirl interventions leave me with more questions than answers, but usually they leave me with far better questions than I began with. May your curiosity be unceasing. 
May your rage be a force for good. What you build is infinitely more important than what you tear down. When the struggle feels unwinnable, may you never forget this one thing. You got this. We got this.